All right, guys, today we are going to talk about how to build the ultimate intake manifold for your turbo car. As you can see, sitting here on the table, we've made quite a few intake manifolds, and I want this video to sort of sum up all of the things that we have learned from all of this hard work. So without further ado, let's get into the four main parts of an intake manifold. The first part of any intake manifold is something that is kind of overlooked, and that is the actual flange that bolts to the engine. This is kind of important. Obviously, you got to be able to bolt the thing up, bolt holes have to be in the right location, ports have to be in the right location, but getting this to be very accurate and precise is very important. Guys have seen massive power upgrades by getting the uh, intake ports perfectly matched to the cylinder head. And this is often a, uh, a thing that has to be done on a case by case basis. Casting it can only be so precise. And what you will see on high dollar builds is they will take this uh, pattern here for your intake runner and they will do what is called port matching it to your cylinder head. Now, if we look at a factory intake manifold, which I have here, it's made out of plastic, you will notice that the intake port on the uh, factory intake is actually undersized for the cylinder head. You can actually pick up power by going to an aftermarket setup like we did with these billet intake runners. These are perfectly matched to the size of the intake port on the cylinder head. And if you pick up a little bit here and a little bit there, it can turn into a big upgrade if you really do your homework. The next part that we need to talk about are the actual intake runners. Right here, this is the first sheet metal intake that I ever made. I made the thing with a six inch intake runner. Next, after I learned a little bit on how to weld and um, you know how to better manufacture parts, I made this manifold you see here in the middle and it features a five inch intake runner. By this point, I had learned that making intake runners kind of sucks. So I went to this style that you see right here which uh, we just installed this style setup on the 2010 Camaro that you guys may have seen on the channel here lately. Now, as you probably noticed, we have been gradually getting shorter and shorter on the intake runner. And that is because the intake runner has a, um, a great effect on how efficient the intake manifold is at particular engine RPMs. And to sort of briefly summarize how this effect uh, will change the power curve in your engine, the shorter your intake runner on your intake setup, the higher the RPM that the intake will favor. And we very much saw that with this billet intake runner setup on the Camaro as it was trying to peak at around 77 to 7,900 RPMs on the dyno. That being said, there's much more to an intake runner than just the length. And this is certainly not my original thought. Um, there's actually somebody in the uh, Atlas community who has put a lot of time and energy into uh, coming up with the ideal intake runner shape. And um, that is what I have tried to uh, come up with with these billet intake runners that you see here. What he found is that on the flow bench, you don't want to go from like a circular shape to a rectangular shape for the uh, 4200 intake runner. And it is much better to go with a straight rectangular shape all the way down the intake runner. And I think we saw the fruits of that on the Camaro build that we just finished on the channel. Unfortunately, with stuff like this, there's not really like a one size fits all solution to uh, everybody's engine. Um, you're gonna be dealing with 
what does the factory casting look like? And is it a four valve engine? Is it a five valve engine? Is it a, you know, a, a two valve engine? And every engine is going to be uh, different and you're gonna have to deal with it on a case by case basis. Figuring out the runner length shouldn't be too bit difficult, but finding the ideal runner shape, um, that's a whole nother game. Another thing to talk about with the intake runner is your injector placement. Now, as you can see with both the uh, manifold that I have here on my left and the intake runner manifold here on my right, we have added a secondary set of injectors for uh, both of these intake manifolds because we went to a 12 injector setup. Now, luckily with a 4200, the uh, stock injectors are down by the intake ports, um, actually casted into the factory cylinder head. So for uh, the majority of people, this isn't a big deal and you don't really have to worry about injector placement on the manifold. But it's something that we should, we should talk about. In general, the further you get your injector away from the cylinder, the more time that the fuel has to atomize and uh, it creates for uh, a more efficient uh, setup where basically you don't have as many liquid droplets in that intake manifold charge and you get a cleaner uh, burn of your fuel. The other side of that is getting the thing to uh, cold start and to get it to have a smooth throttle response. It is actually better to get the uh, injectors closer to the intake valve um, just because it's easier to get the fuel in there quickly when there's rapid changes in airflow or when you have colder cylinder walls and uh, atomization is not as um, um, easily achieved. The next thing that we need to talk about is the intake plenum. The plenum is defined as the volume from the uh, throttle body to the intake runners. And uh, in general, what I have found from my research is that you should try to make this volume of air here to be uh, one and a half to two times the uh, total displacement of the engine. So if you have a 4.2 liter, it should be anywhere from 6.3 to 8.4 liters. And this may be the sort of thing that is more um, applicable to a naturally aspirated setup but in our testing, we haven't really seen a ton of difference. As you can see, the factory intake manifold, the plenum isn't really that big. Um, I'm not really sure what the plenum volume for these are, but as you can see here with this intake manifold in the center, we went to a much larger plenum and we maintain that plenum volume here with the manifold on my right. And then we went to this style plenum here uh, on the most recent intake that we have done. We haven't really seen any correlation with uh, these intake manifolds. In fact, this one, which is by far smaller than both of these two, uh, has been the one that has performed the best. So I don't really have great data here, but if we look at Brett Lasala's Mustang, he actually went from a three liter plenum to a five liter plenum on his uh, coyote powered Mustang, and he saw almost no difference at 3000 horsepower. So if he didn't see a difference at that crazy amount of output, then I don't think it's really, um, really relevant for us down here at um, under a thousand horsepower. Now the idea with a plenum is you can think of it as like a battery or maybe like a capacitor. Basically, uh, air gets logged up into this plenum and then as the intake valve for each of our runners opens up, it will draw off of this uh, battery or storage of uh, pressure. And the idea is that you don't want this to bleed down too far so that when the next cylinder opens up and wants to draw air, um, there isn't any there for it to get. 
As I was editing this video, I thought of something else that I forgot to mention when talking about the intake plenum, and that is the actual entry of the air into the intake plenum. Now there are two typical styles for uh, this particular aspect, and that is a side feed or a center feed. And this will affect how the air is distributed among the cylinders in the engine. This is very important because if you have more air biased towards a particular cylinder and you're injecting the same amount of fuel across all cylinders, you'll get a little bit leaner air fuel mixture in that cylinder and you could cause things to burn up. Now in general, a side feed manifold is intended for combinations where you don't have the type of clearance to accept a center feed. Additionally, a side feed intake manifold looks a little more attractive, at least in my opinion, so there is that aspect as well. So in combinations where you can't get a center feed, there are actually a lot of uh, companies such as OEMs that spend a lot of time making a side feed work as if it is a center feed. You see this on the GM LS series intake manifolds where it sort of feeds into the center of the intake manifold and then flares out to all the other cylinders. And you will also see this on like the Holly low ram intakes that they just came out with where you'll see certain ports in the, uh, the common plenum are angled away or towards the uh, side feed of the intake and um, this is intended to try to balance out the airflow of the engine. The last thing that we need to talk about on intake runner design is the uh, entry from the uh, intake ports into the plenum. This is an area of particular interest um, just because people have really optimized the shape of this and seen massive power upgrades um, based on this uh, transition. Now with this intake manifold that I made here, I spent a lot of time making these uh, velocity stacks down inside of the intake manifold because guys have done testing and found out that these velocity stacks can result in a substantial improvement in the uh, airflow of the manifold. People have seen as much as a 5% improvement for the intake runner performance by doing this. And if you can, it is definitely worth the upgrade. For the billet intake runner setup that we just ran on the Camaro, you'll notice that there are very sharp edges here between the, uh, the intake ports and the plenum but I designed this little bell mouth here, which I had CNC machined, and then I welded these guys onto our intake runners to give it that nice bell mouth shape. Now let's get into some actual experimental data. We have run all of these intake setups with the same camshaft profiles, and Let's start off with the factory intake manifold. By far, this intake has the smallest intake plenum volume and the longest intake runners. And on the Fairmont Futura that we built, we saw this engine peak out at around 6,700 RPM. Next, let's move on to this uh, sheet metal intake that I made. It features a five inch runner length. I ran this setup on my Fairmont station wagon and we saw this intake runner peak out at around uh, 7,300 RPM. Last, let's look at this billet intake runner setup. We ran this on our 2010 Camaro SS project. It has a three inch intake runner, and we saw this setup uh, wanting to peak out at around 77 to 7,900 RPM. So as you can see, the intake runner length has a uh, massive effect on how the engine wants to perform at particular RPMs. And depending on what you do, you may want it to peak out at a lower RPM or a higher RPM. 
For us being uh, drag racers and people that have access to uh, things called torque converters, we want the RPM to generally be as high as possible in the RPM range because it's easier to make horsepower that way. But if you're in a road race application where you're frequently going to be coming out of a corner uh, at you know, three to 4,000 RPM and you need the engine to make as much average horsepower as possible, you may find that a longer intake runner is more beneficial. So it all comes down to what are your goals and what are you trying to accomplish? All right, guys, I am going to wrap this video up here. I hope that you guys enjoyed uh, watching this uh, video and I hope that you learned something. Leave a comment down below if you disagree with anything that I said. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts or maybe leave a comment down below if you have something else to add. With that, I am going to end this video off here. Make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you in the next one. One last thing before we wrap up the video, just a reminder, next weekend is the Atlas Nationals at Killcare Dragway in Ohio. So if you're in the area, make sure you swing by and say hello. Also, if you have an Atlas powered vehicle, consider entering the event. Links to the event will be in the description.